compiler construction class two. So last time what we did is we had a really simple language that we call R0. And R0 programs consisted of a very small number of things. They have, uh, you know, like addition. They have an operation called read. They have um, numbers. And they also have negation. And that's all the functionality of um, R0. We're going to extend this into um, a bigger language. It's going to be called R1. And R1 is just like R0, except that we're going to be um, including a new thing, which is that ease can also include variables. And there's a new form that is the let statement. And we write a let like this. Let var be e inside of e. You can also write it like let var equal e in e. So let's start off with just the intuition for um, how this works. So for instance, if we were to write the following program, let x equal 1 in let y equal 2 in the addition of x plus y, close that, close that, close that, then this program should evaluate to 3. Let's look at another program. Let's say if we have let x equals 1 in let x equals 2 and plus xx, then this program should evaluate to 3 also. Sorry, it should evaluate to 4 because the innermost, uh, when you see a variable, you look at the innermost binding. Uh, and so that means we're looking for that one. And so this is called uh, shadowing. So um, at this point, we can now do things like naming the results of a return, sorry, of a read. So we can do something like let x equals read in plus xx. And this is going to be, we don't know, it depends on what someone types in. But we read the value once, and then we use that value two times, meaning that uh, there's not a separate read for each one of these x's. There's just one single read. OK, now that our program is bigger, we need to go update all the little components of our compiler. So we've updated our um, grammar. So we need to update our abstract syntax tree definitions. We need to update our interpreter. We need to update all the different pieces. So let's go through and talk about how we do each one of those. So how do we update the interpreter? Well, for R0, our interpreter was a function that took in an R0 expression and returned a number. With R1, our interpreter needs to be a little bit more complicated. It needs to take in something that's called an environment, and then an E, and then return the number. Now, what is an environment? An environment is a mapping from variables to numbers. Now, you may ask yourself, like, how is this consistent with what the previous definition of interp was that we use for compiler correctness? where we have to be able to say, given a program, how can you determine what the answer is? Well, in this case, we need to be a little bit more precise. So R0 and R1, they have this larger category called program, and the interp for those just takes in a program and returns the answer. But what they do is they call this inner thing for uh, individual expressions. So in other words, really, there's sort of like two interp functions. There's like the interp for e's and the interp for e's, and then there's also interp for p's, which takes a R0 program, and interp for p's that takes a R1 program. Okay? And the p function doesn't have this additional parameter right there. And of course, the environment starts off empty. And let's write down our definition. So I'm going to write it in kind of a long form. So we'll say that if we are interpreting, we have an environment, and we have some expression e. And what we want to do is we want to consider the different cases of e. 
And if we were to get a number, n, then we'll just return n. If we got a negation of an expression, then what we'll do is we'll just take negative 1 and multiply it by calling interp on the same environment in the embedded expression e. If we have an addition of a left and a right, we'll, we'll call interp on the environment and the left, and then add that to calling interp in the environment on the right. So this is just what we had before. Now we've added one new thing, which is if we have a let statement that has the variable being let, being bound, x, the expression it is bound to, and then the thing that it is bound inside of, which we sometimes call the body expression. Well, what do we do? What we do is we say interp of environment prime and the body expression where environment prime is equal to the old environment with a binding that goes from x to the interp of the environment and the x expression. So what we do is we evaluate the expression that we're being that we're binding it to, figure out whatever the value is, and then store that in the environment mapping. The last thing that we need to say is what happens when we see a variable. If we see a variable, then we just look it up inside of the environment. This right here is our entire interpreter for our new language. Great. Now the next thing that we need to do is we need to extend our random gen our random program generator. Um, you know, of course, behind the scenes, you'll want to like make a pretty printer and you'll want to make a bunch of test programs. But the next thing that we want to do is um, update our random generator. Let's do that. So again, we're going to have to change the signature a little bit. So it used to be that randp would only take in a number and return an R0 program. Our new randp, though, it's going to take in a little bit more information. It's going to take in a set of variable and an integer and then return an R1 program. This set right here are the bound variables. Now what do I mean by that? Well, we would like it so that our program can generate, our random generator program can generate programs that actually make use of variables. So what's the right way to do that? Well, basically what we need to do is we need to say like, if randp got some set of variables and zero, what are the ways that we could have a program uh, of size zero? Well, basically what we want to do is we want to take one of the following choices. So we either want to take the choice of a random number, or calling read, or referencing one of the variables inside of the variables. So the way that my code works for this is I wrote this function that's called choices, and you give it a list of um, you basically give it a list of functions that take no arguments, a list of funks. One of those returns a random number, one of them returns a read. And then what we do is we have another one that is going to pick a random variable. And it will only pick a very and it will only call choices with three things if there's actually anything inside of these. And if there's nothing inside of these, then it will only switch between these two options. Okay. So then what we can do is we can say that if brand p was instead called with 1 plus n, then in that case what we'll do is we'll select between different choices. We'll select between the same thing that we did before, which was a negation of rand p, the variables in n, or we'll select between an addition of rand p, the variables in n, and rand p, the variables in n. But now there's another option, which is the other option, it will return um, let x equal ran p variables n inside of ran p variables prime n, where variables prime 
equals the variables unioned with x, where x is a random variable. Now, the way that my random variables work uh, is basically I just um, basically keep a counter um, of how many variables I've generated, and I just name the variables like v0, v1, v2. Essentially, it's not really, band, r really random. What I do is I basically say like x equals v and then the size of v's. And then now I get a unique little token right there. So this random function, what it can do is it can generate programs like the following. It'll generate like, you know, let uh, v0 equal let v1 equal 2 in plus v1 3. Okay, so this right here is the result of calling ran p on 3, because notice that its height is 3, there's the let, the plus, and then inside, so that's actually, I guess it's 2. 1, 2, so it's 2. Um, and then we need, we'd have something else with 2, so maybe this one would be a subtraction, that's one level, and then an addition of v0 and a read. This right here would be an example of a random program that could be generated. Now, what's its value? Um, well, its value is basically uh, the it's, it's read minus 5. So if we were to optimize this, we would expect it to be optimized to the addition of negative 5 and read. Why is that? Because v1 is 2, so we have 2 plus 3 is 5. And we substitute that in for v0, so we get the subtraction of an addition of 5 and read, so that it gets negative 5 read. Okay. Now we want, to op we want to improve our optimizer as well. So how is our optimizer going to work? Again, our optimizer is going to be adjusted, so it's going to take an environment and an E and return an E. Okay. Now, the key rules are going to be the rule for optimizing a variable. We're just going to return whatever the environment says the variable is. Okay. But now, we need to have another rule for our optimizer. When there's a let. Okay, now how are we going to do this? Well, the first thing that we want to do is we definitely want to optimize XE um, because we want to figure out what that is. And let's call that XE prime equals the optimization in the environment of XE. Now notice that this let right here, this is a let like in the language we're writing the compiler in. So in the language of the compiler, we're going to optimize XE. Okay, well, now, what do we want to do next? Basically, what we could do is if XE prime was optimized into something simple, like a number or another variable, then what we could do is we could just remove this let from the program like we did up here because this plus v13, sorry, this 2 right here, we could optimize it directly into that spot and get a 2. That's kind of what we're doing right here. And then we could add those together and get 5, and then that means that we would have v0 equals 5, and then we could optimize that away. But we wouldn't want to do this if the expression after it was optimized was like big and complicated. And what I mean by big and complicated was like an addition or something like that. Because um, if it were big, then if we substitute it in, then it would get copied multiple times potentially. So maybe what we want to do is you want to say something like this. If simple xe prime, then what we'll do is we'll return optimize 
in an environment where x maps to xe prime in the body, but otherwise what we'll do is we will return a let with x, xe prime, and an optimization where the environment maps x to x inside of the body. Okay, now what simple does is simple takes an expression and says whether or not it's simple. And essentially, variable is simple and number is simple, but everything else isn't. So these will go to true, otherwise we'll have false. So we have a variable or number that's true, otherwise it's false. This implementation is fine, but, you know, maybe we could do even better than that. So imagine that, um, imagine that this variable x only occurs in the program one time. So here's what I mean by that. So, so suppose that we have the following program. Let x equal plus read read inside of plus 2x. Okay? Now this program right here, um, we might want to simplify it to plus 2 plus read. I'm just going to do a capital R for read. Okay, so I don't have to write so much. We could optimize it like that. But we wouldn't want to optimize if the body were instead plus xx. We would not want to optimize it to plus rr plus rr because that would have four reads when there's only supposed to be two. Similarly, um, yeah. By the way, I'm, this example uses read because... Um, Anything that doesn't involve read would be optimized down to a number. So that's why I wouldn't do an example like, you know, plus 2, 3, because we know that the plus 2, 3 would get turned into 5, and then it would be simple. So basically, we might want to have a distinction between things that are... It's not that they're... It's not like things that are simple will always get substituted. And then if something isn't simple, we'll basically have a little check that says, do we use it more than once? Okay. But now, maybe even that's a bad idea, because think about this. What if we had um, this same let body, I'm uh, sorry, this, the same x and xe, but then the body of the program was plus read x. In that case, if we use this rule that says if something is only used once, you can substitute it, then we would end up with the program plus read plus read read. And now here's a problem. In the original program, this would be the first read, this would be the second, and this would be the third. But in the program that comes out, this would be the first, and then this would be the second, and then this would be the third. So that means that they would get reordered. So this is one of the crucial things that you need to think about when you're writing um, optimizations. They have to make it so that the program behaves exactly the same as it did before. And the main way that you're going to hit a, hit a hiccup of that is when, the pro, is, is when your program reorders what are called effects. Effects are modifications to state that your program causes. So in this case, the modification to state is, you know, printing, is, uh, you know, requesting, an, requesting a number. That's an example of an effect. So I don't really think that we can improve this much with, um, with this version of the program. Okay. So at this point, we now have a more advanced language, R1. So R1 has addition, subtraction, variables, and lets. And that language, even though it's really simple, is going to be big enough for us to do an interesting compiler. And we're actually going to spend a lot of time basically spinning on this exact compiler. Sorry, on this exact language, trying to get it to compile. Now. we now have to talk about what it is that we're actually compiling to. Okay. So how can we do, how can we, how can we explain this? In this class, we're going to compile 
to x86-64 assembly. If you were on a laptop, you probably have x86-64 uh, machine. Now, of course, you could be on like a Chromebook with ARM, or you could be on one of the new uh, Apple Silicon things. If you're using one of those languages, uh, sorry, if you're using one of those platforms, um, then uh, your, your compiler will work the same way in principle, but a lot of the details are going to be different. And uh, if I remember, I'll comment about when those details are. But in principle, you can do everything that we're going to do, but I'm going to explain this assuming that you have x 64 So what we are going to do is we're going to write a compiler that goes from our R1 language, and we're not going to go directly to x 64 We're going to go to a representation of x 64 that we're going to call x0. And x0 is a really basic version of x86-64 that is quite simple. So let's talk about how x0 works. So x0, a program, is, it says program, there's some information, and then there's a mapping from a label to a block and then there are many of these. Now, what is a block? Actually, let me let me not write it as the word block. Let me write it as let me write it as BLK. So BLK is the category. And what a BLK is is block with some info and then a sequence of instructions. This three dot 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 here, by the way, means uh, zero or more of these. So there can be zero or more labels, labeled blocks, there can be zero or more instructions. Okay, now what is an instruction? An instruction, there's gonna be a lot of them. You can have uh, an add queue of an argument and an argument. You could have a you could have a subtract queue. A, it's called sub queue of an arg and an arg. You could have a move queue of an arg and an arg. You could have a ret queue by itself. You could have a neg queue of an arg. You can have a call queue of a label. You can have a jump of a label. You can have a push queue of an arg and a pop queue of an arg. Okay. Each one of these things are named after the actual instructions that are on x86. Now you may ask, why do they all end in Q? Q in x86-64 assembly stands for quad, which is four things. So what are the four things that it is? Well, your x86 machine thinks that it is a 64-bit computer. And since it's a 64-bit computer, uh, that means a 64-bit quantity is sit is a uh, four 64 sorry four 16-bit things, and so since four 16-bit things equals 64, that means that normal values that you think about when you use your computer, the 64-bit ones, those are called quads inside of the assembly. So what add queue does is it adds them together, sub queue uh, subtracts them, move queue moves this one into that one, return stops, negate negates call calls a function, jump jumps to a new label, push pushes something onto the stack, and pop pops it off the stack. Now what are these arguments? Arguments are either numbers, which are written as dollar sign $n, um, or they are registers, which are written percent %rn, or they are memory offsets, which are written percent register number and then in parentheses an offset. Or 
they are a variable. Okay, and what are the register names? The register names come from a very large set. There's um, RSP, RBP, RBX. Sorry, no, no, sorry. R R A X, R B X, R C X, R D X, R S I, R D I, and then R eight through R fifteen. And these are all the different registers. Now, each one of these, each one of these, um, has a different um, which I think this I think this uh, syntax might be offset uh, percent rn I forget it's one of the it's one of the other okay now each one of these um, things has a different uh, you know way to uh, a different um, it has a different behavior inside of the machine. Um, by the way, the uh, these notations um, I use a different way of writing them on the notes. This one is called a constant. This one is called a register. This one is called a dereference, and this one is called a reference because it is a dereference of the number of the register relative to some number. Okay. This abstract representation of x86 programs, you can output this in the actual format that the uh, that your assembler uses, and basically, it kind of looks like, I mean, these things you basically just put a comma between them. So, like an add queue of uh, these things, you just write add queue and then whatever this is, comma whatever that thing is, um, and Whenever you have a program, you just spit out all the labels and the blocks. And to label a block, you just write just like a go to statement, sorry, just like a label in C. You write, you know, whatever the label is, colon, whatever. So we can actually write a function. We'll call it emit for that. So we'll write a function called emit. And what emit does is it's going to take an X program and produce, you know, output. Output. Okay, so how do, what does emit look like? So if you call emit on a program with some info and then some um, some blocks, then what we do is oh, you know what? Okay, um, what we'll do is we'll say, um, well, I'll put dot global. This is just the syntax for uh, how um, assembly looks. So dot global main, and then we'll write main colon. And then what we'll do is we'll call emit on each one of the blocks. Okay, now how do you emit a block? So when you emit a block, you have a mapping that goes from its label to the actual block, which has some information and some instructions. And what we'll do there is we'll put out the label with a colon, and then we'll emit the instructions. Now, how do we emit the instructions? If we call emit on add queue of um, of the source and the destination, then what we'll do is we will spit out add queue of calling emit on the source, comma emit on the destination. And you know what, maybe what I'll do is I'll put these in quotes 
So you can tell like these are the strings that we're spitting out. Maybe I'll put like a dollar sign here to say like we're going to interpolate this. And then over here we're going to print out that and you know the actual comma there. So all the other instructions look like that. And then when you emit an argument like a constant of some n, then you're going to print out the dollar sign and then you're going to print out n. Okay, so what emit does is it can turn one of these things into a string. What you should do after you define your x0 ASTs and you define your emitter, you should write manually some actual um, x86 assembly programs. Now, the, I'm not going to explain assembly in a lot of detail, because I assume that you've already done that, but maybe the key thing to remember about assembly The key thing to remember about assembly is, is that uh, programs have um, basically like a fixed set of 16 variable variables. That's what the registers are. And if you want to, uh, you know, run a program, uh, sorry, if you want to do an operation, then you have to um, you have to do that using the small number of uh, options that you have. So, for instance, like we could write like here's a simple program that we could write. I'm going to write it in assembly and then in our x0 language. So we could say like main, and then we could say move q. And I, I always forget if the source goes first or second. Uh, so I'm, I'm going to put this, the destination first. So if I want to move into rax uh, 8. And then I'm going to move into rbx 10 and then I'm going to do an add queue of rax and rbx and then I'm going to do a return queue All right if I were to run this if I were to compile this program and run it like on the command line and of course I would have to add dot global main and uh, the particular name of this uh, might be different on, depending on what platform you're on. So I think that on like uh, OS X, it has to be underscore main. Maybe it has to be underscore main on Windows too. This is kind of one of those little niggling details that are really annoying. Um, on the site, I linked to a, um, an x86 uh, assembly cheat sheet that, that talks about all of those things. So the way that this program works is it starts by moving 8 into RAX, 10 into RBX, and then it takes RAX and adds RBX to it and gets the final answer of 18. We can write this program in our format by writing it as program, no info, and then we would say that main equals the block with no info, and then the instructions are move queue of the register rax and the constant 8, and then a move queue of the register rbx and the constant 10, and then an add queue of the register rax and the register rbx, and then a return queue. Close the list of instructions, close the block, close the label to block assignment, close the program. So this assembly program would be represented by this AST. Okay. So now, you have on your computer a um, compiler from this textual format to the actual machine code. So let's think of it like this. Suppose you had an X0 program. You could take that and you could run a MIT and you could get back a string. Okay, that string you can then call AS or 
NASM, or GAS. There are many different assemblers that you could use. And that will give you machine code. And you can take that machine code and execute it. And then that's going to give you back an answer. In that sense, x86, we now have a way of interpreting it and getting an answer. What you're going to do is you're going to make another interpreter. An interpreter just for x0. And then what you're also going to do, well, we already have this, we have a program that goes from R1 up to the answer. And we're going to write a compiler that goes from R1 to X0. So we're going to have this big network right here where we can start, we can take an R1 program and we can interpret and get an answer. Then we can compile it and get an X0 program, which we can then interpret and get an answer, or we can omit it, assemble it, and then execute it and expect to get the same answer in all cases. You already wrote interp R. Your processor is exec. The assembler already exists. The emitter already exists. We just wrote that. So the things that we need to write are the compiler and the interpreter for the X language. So let's write the interpreter for the X language next. <clears throat> we're going to call this function, um, we're going to call it XI for X interpreter. And there will be the P version. So this is going to take an X0 program and produce uh, a number. All right? So XI will take a program, a program, and it's going to have, uh, you know, an info thing, and it's going to have a mapping from labels to blocks. And what it's going to do is it's going to call the xi block function on um, the machine state and zero and the main function. Sorry, the main label. Okay. Now, what is a machine state? A machine state is going to be defined as the following. It's going to be a mapping from register number, register names to numbers combined with a mapping from addresses to numbers, that's memory, combined with a mapping from variables to numbers combined with a mapping from labels to blocks. And machine state zero, that's the first machine state, it is gonna be equal to something that no matter what register number it gets, it always returns zero, because they all start off zero. No matter what address it gets, it always returns zero. No matter what variable it gets, it always returns zero. And its mapping from labels to blocks is the label to block um, mapping that we were given, that we were given as part of the program. So basically, the machine state records what the value of registers are, what the value of memory is, what the value of variables are, and what the values of labels are. By the way, what are these variables? The variables are these things, and they actually don't have, there's no way to uh, emit them. So this is kind of a weird thing. We're actually going to make sort of, in addition to, sorry, the way that this compiler is going to work is that R1 is first going to take an R program and turn it into a version of X0 that has variables. And then we're going to write something that takes x0 programs with variables and turns them into things without variables. So, yeah, so that's going to be a, a thing that we're going to do. So our interp function will work when there are variables, but emit won't. 
So essentially, yeah. Okay. All right. So now this xib function, xib is going to take a machine state combined with a label, and it's going to return a number. Okay. How is it going to work? So you call xib and you give it some machine state and some label. And what it will do is it's going to call xi on the instructions. Sorry, it's going to call xii, that's for instructions. And you're going to give it the machine state. And you're going to give it, you're going to look up inside of the machine state the label arrow block function. Then you're going to pass it the label, and that's going to return one of these blocks, and you're going to look at its list of instructions. Okay. Now, x i i, it takes a machine state and a list of instructions. Actually, um, let's not call this xii, let's call it xis for instructions. Because its definition is, is that xis will take a machine state, and then if you give it an empty list of instructions, it just returns the machine state dot rax, let's say. Or sorry, dot... Yeah, let, me, uh, let me clarify something. We don't want to return a number here or there. What we want to do is we want to return a machine state. A machine state here, and this is going to return a machine state. And so if the list of instructions is empty, then we just return the machine state. And if it's not empty, then that means that there's something at the front of the list. So we'll write cons, and that we'll call this i0 and is for instructions. And so what we'll do there is we're going to say, um, we're going to call xii. Ooh, I'm off the screen. Um, how can I move this around? I get an idea. So if there's more than one thing, that means that we have a cons of i0 and ir. And what we'll do is we're going to call xii with the machine state, the first instruction, and then the rest of the instructions. OK, now all of the interesting work is going to happen in xii. Okay, how is XII going to work? So XII, it takes a machine state and an instruction and a list of instructions. Okay. Think about an instruction like add q. So if we call xii with a machine state, the instruction being add q of the source and the destination and the rest of the um, the rest of the instructions, what do we want to return? Well, what we want to do is we're going to do xis of machine state prime and k, where machine state prime is equal to the machine state where we go and we find the destination and we replace it 
with looking at the machine state, what, what the machine state says the source is, and adding that to what the machine state says the destination is. Okay, now this is a shorthand notation. And why is it a shorthand notation? It's a shorthand notation because what does it mean to say what is the source? Uh, what, what does the machine state say a source is? And how does this, how does this set happen? Well, really what, what we mean here is that there's a function that we're going to call set. Actually, let's, uh, let's write it out like this. So what we'll do is we'll say that ms of an arg arrow number, okay, what does that mean? That is our, that's going to be our notation for the following function. We're going to say, well, first, look and see what kind of argument it is. If the argument is um, a constant, then we'll error because this doesn't make any sense. You can't modify a constant. Um, if instead it's not a constant, but it is a register, then what we'll do is we'll return a machine state where the register uh, name to number function is equal to the old register name to number function, except that now the register name maps to the number, the new number. Let's call that new number uh, n, n, for new number, n, n. And if it's not a constant, not a register, then maybe it's a variable. In which case, we have, we return the same machine state, except that the variable to number function is what it used to be, except that now the variable x maps to the new number. And finally, what if it's a dereference? Well, if a dereference, that means that we have a register name and an offset, in which case we have the machine state, and we here we're going to modify memory. It's going to be the same thing that memory used to be, except that we're going to we're going to look up in the machine state what the register, what register of Rn says, and then add the offset to that and then have that map to the new number. Okay. So now we need to define what machine state of arg is. So it's going to be um, a number. Okay. And so machine state of a constant n is just that n machine state of a register, rn, we're going to look at the machine state rn function and look at the register. We'll call it the registers, yeah. If we get um, a variable, x, then we're going to look at the machine state variables and look at the x variable. If we have a machine state of an offset, of a register number and sorry, register name and an offset, then in that case we're going to look at memory. So we're going to say dot memory, and we're going to do ms of the register rn, and then we're going to add the offset to it and read that spot in memory. Okay. So that's for just something like add queue. Subtract Q is going to be very similar. It's just going to have a minus there. Negate is going to be similar. It'll just have the destination. The ones that are more interesting are how are push, pop, uh, and jump and return. Okay. So what we'll do here is we'll say that you know if you call x i i and you give it um, and you give it the machine state and then a push queue of the source, nk, 
then in that case, what we're going to do uh, is we're going to do um, xis of the machine state prime in k, where the machine state prime is going to be equal to the machine state where um, where percent RSP uh, of uh, zero is going to be equal to what the machine state says the source is, and then percent RSP is going to be changed to uh, whatever the current. Actually, this right here is the uh, yeah. So that's a reference um, where the, what the machine state says RSP is uh, minus eight. And if we look at what pop does, pop Q will get a destination, in a K, and it'll say MS prime of K. And MS prime in this case is going to say that whatever the destination is, Sorry, it's not a percent, it's just destination. That the destination will map to what the machine state says RSP of zero is, and, um, and then RSP will get mapped to what RSP is plus eight. Okay, so now we have add, subtract, negate, push, pop. Okay, so the next thing that we want to do is we want to say what happens when we're in a machine state and we see a jump to a label. Well, in this case, we can just forget what K is and go run XIB of the machine state and the label. So go look up what that label is. And if we have a call queue to something like read, so the label read, let me uh, move this around. XII MS K. In this case, we'll have XII of MS prime, sorry, XIS of MS prime in K, where MS prime says that we have the machine state, except that we map RAX to be do a read. So whatever logic you used inside of your R0 interpreter for doing a read, you'll do that exact same thing here, except that now you'll be assigning the value to RAX inside of the abstraction of the x86 machine. Then finally, the last thing that we need is we need to do what happens when you have a return queue. And when you have a return queue, what we'll do is we'll escape from this program, escape from xi and return um, the machine state for rax. Okay, and this is going to allow you to um, this is going to allow you to um, interpret and uh, simulate x86 programs, or at least a very small subset of them, um, inside of your compiler, so you can build a testing apparatus like, where is it? Like this picture right here. So we have our R1 programs, we can interpret them. We have our x0 programs, we can interpret them, or we can emit them compile them, and then execute them. Now what we're going to do next is we're going to talk about how to actually do the compilation from R1 to X0. We've now just sort of laid the foundation for making this even possible.
So we'll talk about that next time.